All right, now, so we've covered our mission. We'll come back to these things later. So this is a mission as a church. Now the question is, all this salvation, the knowledge of God, repentance, forgiveness of sins, this is all preparing people for the second coming. Yes? Isn't that right? So now, as a campus, we are now the church working in a very specific mission field. Are you with me? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. Respond. So now, all I'm simply doing then is my mission becomes to prepare my campus, just fill it in, you know, for the second coming of Jesus. That preparation comes in all the things that we mentioned. Repentance, forgiveness of sins, the everlasting gospel and revelation, talking about the Holy Spirit, discipleship, baptism, doctrines, all these things are to prepare them for the second coming. So ultimately, this should be your mission. Now, there are some things that we deal with philosophically, right? in terms of our vision. Your vision tells you how you're going to accomplish your mission. Are you with me? So now my vision tells me, okay, what am I going to do? Now we're talking about values. So I'm like, okay, in terms of my, my vision, first of all, whatever you do, it must be Bible-based. Number one, this is a value that has to guide what I do. Why? If you study the word, word, in the book of Acts. Just go home, go to blueletterbible.com or Bible Gateway, type in word in the book of Acts. And what you'll notice is every time the word was preached, souls were added to the church. You preach anything else, you have no power. Ellen White corresponds to the same thing. She says your success is in your simplicity. As soon as you depart from this and conform your methods to the minds of others, your power is gone. So we think, oh yeah, I'm going to depend on the performance or the beauty of this poster. No. It's simply the power of the word. Jesus had no advertising. Who do you think did his website? He didn't have a website. Okay, who did Paul's Facebook? Maybe his posters and his PowerPoint slide designs. They were just so cool. Paul was able to establish whole churches. No. It's because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have, Paul was establishing churches. Stephen was a deacon. His face was glowing like an angel. That's pretty big advertising. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You can't get that from graphic design. You can't get that from cosmetics. Can you make my face glow like an angel? <laughs> I think it'll help increase the people who come to our Bible study. Every time I come, my sister is just glowing. That's not going to win souls. That's not what happened. So it has to be Bible based. The power was in the word that was preached. Now, you go on to the fact that it's Bible based, but it's also revival. It has to transform lives. It has to. People have to be changed. Revival, obviously, meaning to live again. So, like, for example, People come in and give Bible studies. You can say, I want to give a Bible study on creation. And they were like, now notice, the first day God created life. And the second day he created the atmosphere. Then the third day he created the earth and then he created plants and trees. And then the fourth day he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then you go to the fifth day and he created birds in the air and animals in the sea. And then the sixth day he created the, earth, the animals on the earth and the creeping things and the insects. But then he also created humanity and then females and, and then God rested. And he said, Amen. That's my Bible study. It's not transforming anybody's life. But if I tell you the creation, the six days could be separated. And I say in verse 2, God says the earth was without form and void. Form is an issue of shape. Void is an issue of filling. So the first three days of creating were about forming the earth. The next three days were about filling the earth. And when God wants to create you, he formed man of the dust and filled him with the breath of life. 
Is there something that God needs to create in your life? He first needs to form and then to fill. Maybe you feel spiritually dead. Maybe your life is like the earth without form and void. You feel empty. See, all of a sudden, the same topic just became life transforming. Are you with me? We're both talking about creation, but it's not transforming your life. I'm not showing you how creation is relevant to you as a student in Bradford, in Manchester. This is what this means to you today. Revival means it must transform lives, right? Next, you get this element of movement. The advantage of student ministry is the fact that you're not an institution. You guys don't have like a board of directors. You don't have like a CEO and like, well, you know, brother, we have bylaws. And, um, you know, the sister, she needs to go through the process if she wants to do a Bible study in her dorm room. Like, what do you mean i got to go through the process? So she needs a girl in class, and the girl's just like, yeah, you know, I'm really interested. I'm struggling with my faith. Hey, sister, I'd love to study with you. Sure. Yeah, come to my room tonight. Then brothers find out. They bring her before the committee. Sister, I heard that you had a Bible study in your room. I did. Would you give that approval? <laughs> funny thing is this actually happens in the church. Because it's an institution. It has to protect its name. Versus a movement, we have a destination. And when that destination is reached, the movement ends. And so the success of any movement is moving. You need to be moving towards your destination. So the benefit as a student is my mission is to prepare whatever for the second coming of Christ. And until I have that, I have a place to move. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And there's flexibility in that. See, as soon as you get like a building on campus, as soon as you get like an office, then you get people who have to get paid full time, creates all kinds of other issues. And now your temptation is to focus on how we're going to pay the secretary rather than how we're going to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's happening to our church. Globally. So now God's using us young people who got no training, no experience, no degree. And the Holy Spirit has put it on our hearts to be like, you know what? We just need to do what he says. And the church leaders, well, you know, we need to be organized. We need to be listening. We're past that. You guys can do whatever you want to do in the office. I'm on campus. I want to win my friends to Christ. Period. That does not require a committee meeting. So don't put me in committee meetings. Don't tell me, hey, come help with Pathfinders and come help with, uh, you know, adventurers. I'm a university student. Nothing to help me with what I'm doing. So this is what's happening is this concept of a movement. Right now, campus ministries, the Adventist church is eons behind. The Catholic church, every university, there's a Catholic church, by the way. Every single one. Everywhere I go in the world, University of Botswana, there's a Catholic church. They thought about this a long time ago. If we get the brightest minds when they're graduating, guess what? This sister grows up, like, wow, you know, she's so great. She's an amazing physicist, and she's Catholic. So, the concept of movement, we need to always be moving towards our destiny. Now, if you have a Bible-based revival movement in which every student is a missionary. Now, this is funny because all I'm doing is I'm taking the, the mission of the church and applying it to campus. As if Jesus commissioned you on campus. Go ye therefore, ye, you all, and make disciples of all nations. Now, you're on campus beginning at the University of Manchester. That's where you need to begin. But before you go, wait for the Holy Spirit. So, in terms of the values that are guiding us, in terms of our vision, it needs to be Bible-based. We need to be connecting people with the Word of God. Number two, transforming lives. You can be reading the Bible, it's not transforming anybody. 
if we don't make it relevant to their lives. Three, we need to be moving towards this destination. Don't forget your mission. And lastly, everyone should be active in the ministry. Everyone. Now, let's talk about a couple other values. So this is where we um, teach in Canvas. We also deal with, I already told you about biblical simplicity, which is right here. So I'm going to have to cover that again. But another big one is our philosophy of excellence. And this excellence needs to be academic as well as spiritual. They need to be combined. Now this is what happens. Students come to campus, I want academic excellence. I need to be the best med student, best communication major, best singer in my first classes, whatever, but you don't have spiritual excellence. See, the whole point is, is when a person is excellent in some area that is not religious, academics, it can be professional. You're a young professional. When you excel in this, people will listen to you talk about this. But who in the world is going to come to you as a student and you're like, yeah, you know, I believe in God, but you're flunky. You're failing the physics exam. Why am I going to listen to you talk about God? When is the last time you took advice from a failing student? You like sought out his advice. Like you were desperate. Does that ever happen to you? I mean, maybe if you're like, let me know what to avoid. Can we talk? <laughs> Tell me about your lifestyle. I want to know what not to do while I'm here at uni. Yeah, you know, that's what I do. By, uh, <laughs> Why don't we do that? But I guess, guess who you're seeking out? The brother who's answering all the questions in the lecture. You're like, I'm totally lost in this economics class. This guy seems to understand what is going on in economics. Guess what I'm going to do? I want to go talk to him. Excuse me, brother. I don't know when you're studying or where, but I need help in this class. Can we study together? The problem is, that's supposed to be us. Now, it can also, there's ministry from the flip side, too. Asking someone for help can also create opportunities of ministry. But that's getting more into the practical. Starting with the values, we must make a commitment as students to be academically excellent and spiritually excellent. Excellent does not mean perfect. We need to be clear on that. I actually need to clarify this a lot. Excellence does not mean perfect. No. It doesn't mean the best. No. It doesn't mean the top. That's not what excellence means. If you study excellence carefully, particularly in the spirit of prophecy, what you find is the word excellence comes from the Latin word excellere, which means to surpass. What's happening with excellence is you are dealing with 100% of what you can produce. And if you came to the Sabbath school yesterday, then you already know where I'm going with this. God created us with an infinite capacity of growth. By virtue of the fact that we're created in the image of God. So what that means is, every time you apply 100%, you're going to do more than what you did last time. Think about the fact that if you could take the same math class over and over and over, what would your grade be by the third time? Probably be 100, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know this exam. Uh -huh. We already covered, you know, pre-calculus, the graph. She did the same. Do you follow what happens? Mm -hmm. Because there's a law built in the mind by God that strength is gained by exercise. That which at first seems difficult when done repeatedly becomes easy. It is a principle. In the human mind, strength is acquired by effort. The more you try to play basketball, the better you become. 
Yes? That's why, what do you think they have? Practice. So they run the same play a hundred times. Because when at first they're like, I don't get this play, coach. After a hundred times, they get the play. This is the same thing, you know, I love, uh, you guys call it football, I call it soccer, because I'm from America, so, I love soccer, right, and the thing I remember when the World Cup was, I was at the general conference at the same time, the World Cup was after, <laughs> so I was really angry, because <laughs> I had to be at the GC, but as soon as I was done, I went home to turn on the World Cup, and I remember, I was there, you know, working on Bible studies, watching the World Cup. And I was, thinking, <laughs> I was thinking to myself, as I was watching these games, right, I think I was watching uh, Spain and Uruguay, or I can't remember which country it was. Oh no, I think they beat Brazil or something. Yeah, Spain beat Brazil. Yeah. yeah, I think it was Brazil. And I remember thinking like, you know, Brazil used to be a lot more polished of a team. Yeah. And I was like, I couldn't put my finger on something. World, right? But I look at Spain, I never liked Spain before. <laughs> you know, I definitely didn't like Holland, but you know, whatever. So, but I noticed watching the Spanish and the Germans, right? And I was watching Brazilians and I was kind of like, man, this is a little weird. Like, Brazilians are a little more polished team. And then it clicked in my mind, they lost to the Spanish, not because the Spanish are better athletes. It's clear the Brazilians can run up and down the field without a problem. They're always running. He kicks up, five Brazilians are up the field. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, where do these guys come from? But this is the point. What the Spanish, the Germans do, and even somewhat of the, the Dutch, you can tell by the way they play. They practiced this before. He already knows where to stand. So with the Brazilians thinking, I'm just going to outrun you up and down the field. You're just going to get tired of running, and then we'll just outrun you and then kick the ball in. Which, I mean, is a good strategy if you're that athletic. But if you're a Spanish or a German, you're like, look, this is calculated. You may outrun me. That's true. But when it comes playtime, and we're setting up, and I have time to set up, you can't win. Already planned. And for them, what do they do? They practice that on the field. And the guy trains them. When you see the ball at this point in the field, this is where you should be standing if you're a striker. This is where you should be. So he knows he's running. The guy kicks the ball to the right. He knows, I better go left. And he says, wait. So then when you're watching on TV, he's not even on the screen until the guy kicks the ball and you see this guy come out of nowhere. Like, what? Headbutting the ball into the goal. You're like, where did he come from? He already practiced it in his mind. Because there's something about repetition that makes things at first difficult, easy. And excellence is about that. The way you grow is by trying, putting 100%. But let me tell you something very important to a university student who's trying to. primary purpose on campus is to be a missionary. If you do not accept that truth, you will not win souls. You won't. And here's the reason. A 100% atheist will never be convinced by a 60% atheist. Never. So you go on campus, you're 100% education, 80% athletes. You can't be 100% athletes because you're 100% something else. Then you go into the atheist, and the atheist is like, I'm 100% atheist, even before my education. If my teacher gets up, he could be the best professor in the world. He starts talking about God created the world in six days, and the atheist is going to be like, this is over. Our relationships, I don't care if you're the best professor in the world. That's the way his mindset works. So for you and I to go on campus and think, I'm going to engage a 100% atheist, and I'm not even a 100% Christian. It'll never happen. You won't convince him. He's dedicated. You 
give him arguments, he goes back online to look for arguments to counter what you say. That's how passionate he is. And that's why when those people get converted, they take it to a whole other level. Because I didn't come into this thing because it was easy. I already grappled with the issues. I already fought over the doctrines. I already struggled over the issues of the Bible. I already done that. I'm 100% sure this is the way to go. Versus we're in the church like, yeah, this would be nice. But we're not spiritually next. We're not. 100%ers. And when you all on campus as a student society become known as 100%ers in a university of 50%ers, even if people don't follow, they will respect what you do. And people say, what is wrong with you? I'm first commissioned, then a student. Disciple of Jesus first. I just happen to be a disciple who goes to this school. But if university defines you, it defines me. You're all. But then you're trying to win souls on the side, like it's like going out to eat or something. Oh yeah, let's go guys, yeah, let's do some outreach. A couple hours, and then go back to my studies. So, I gotta move on from that. For now. So in terms of the values that should guide, just to recap and then I'm gonna open up for questions. We have our mission is to prepare whatever university you're at for the second coming of Christ. We do that by establishing a movement of young people that is Bible-based, that's reviving, which means it's transforming lives, the focus of the Word of God. And every person in the movement is a missionary. It's not an action, it's an identity. You know what a missionary does because they are a missionary. But you don't do things and say, oh, well, I'm not a missionary, I just do missionary kind of, kind of activity. Everyone wants to be a missionary. So going back to the three angels' messages, either you're an angel carrying the message, or you're in need. There's only two groups in the verse. Angels and every nation in your tongue of you. That means it's us and them. And in the angels' mind, if you're not carrying the everlasting gospel, like Jesus says, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering, then you're scattering. It's that simple. We like there to be great, but there is no great. Either we are wholehearted Christians, or we're none at all. And until we make that resolution and consecration in our mind, we can never experience power. The people who change the world are the people who are about changing the world. 100%. So let's open it up for some questions before I get to your <coughs>
the steps in this process. The only thing that is directly biblical is this. Are you following? All of this is like I mingle, desiring your good. So remember that Luke, Mark's gospel said, this gospel is to preach among all nations? In, right? In order for, where he says, you are the salt of the earth, in order for salt to have an effect, it must be mingled with what the substance is. You don't come to your place and go, ooh, need some salt. You take a salt shaker and put it next to your plate. <laughs> Does that change the flavor? <laughs> yes or no? No, no? no. That's what we do when we say, oh, you know, Bradford, you know, it's a mission field, so we plant a church. That doesn't change Bradford. You just put a salt shaker. <clears throat> In order for salt to have an effect on the food, it must come out of the salt shaker. Yes? And be in the food. And guess what happens when you pour it in the food? You don't see the salt anymore. But you can taste the difference. So first with Christ, he says, look, I can't save people from heaven. I gotta come down and live among them. <clears throat> so first thing we do with Muslims, we need to mingle with them just as our own good. We have a problem with this thing called impatience. <laughs> impatience. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 that love suffers long. Two things young people need. Suffering and love. <laughs> <laughs> this hurts. I don't want it. Man, this thing takes forever. You walk into a program and I'm like, welcome to you. What do you want to study? Ah, oh, I want to study chemistry. You'll be here for nine years. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> I changed my major. <laughs> and we go back like, hold on. And you know what happens? We start thinking, well, what's the shortest major? <laughs> That I can complete, like, I ain't trying to be here forever. 10,000 pounds a year? No, I don't have money like that. This is how we think. We're impatient. So we do the same thing with souls. I keep giving to this friend, just desiring their good. I'm just trying to, when is this thing going to turn into a Bible study? Suffer long. That's never that you come up. This is the Apostle Paul, right? So he's simply telling them, he's like, look, I'm writing about love. We quote this thing in weddings, like, that's what Paul was thinking. No. He was talking to a church about spiritual gifts. His point is, love is a spiritual gift. It's not natural to you. And tongues is not the greatest spiritual gift or manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Love is. And it's the gift that everyone has to have. That's what's powerful about Christianity. The most powerful gift is the gift that's available to everyone. You should have said it then. Yeah, great gift, available, whatever. <laughs> no, and when he's thinking about attributes of how love manifests itself in the life, Paul says the first thing that comes to his mind is not kind. It's not, not easily provoked. It's not seeking not its own. The first thing that comes to his mind is patience. He says love is used to dealing with long periods of time. We all love a good love story. He waited five years. <laughs> he was in prison. She waited five years. All of these opportunities, but she loved him. Man, I don't know if I can wait that long. And we're all venerating these people. But love is used to dealing with long periods of time. Your parents raised you for a long time. Mm -hmm. Every day providing for your meals? Mm -hmm. Three meals a day? You're like, man, I gotta beat this kid. <laughs> House this kid, clothe this kid. All of this for 18 years. Almost. At least. At least. At least. And that's the you grow up. Mom, I want to stay home. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> My patience is out. It's time for you to move on. I love you. <laughs> Your parents suffer long. That's why you see grandparents, they don't want to worry about anything. You wonder why grandparents just want to be at home. Listen, I don't work. Took care of kids. 
I'm going to sit still. <laughs> That's all they want to do. Just want to sit there and hum. You know, sing songs. <laughs> like, Grandma, what you humming about? Thing is, just life. <laughs> I'm just there for life. And all of that is to simply say, the love is what led them to stay. All that time. When you were disobedient, when you were frustrated, when you're like, Mom, I want this, when your relationship was bad, your parents still went to work. That's why you say, how, does my, how do I know if my mother loves me? That food is love in physical form. Mm -hmm. You got nothing to do with this preparation. Mm -hmm. You go to bed in that room and the heat is on, the light is on, that's love. In physical form. And so many kids will sit in their room with their computer plugged into the wall watching YouTube, angry at their parents, chatting on Facebook. I hate my mom. If it wasn't for your mom, you wouldn't be chatting. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have no computer. You wouldn't have no power. You probably wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't even be alive. <laughs> you just go on and on. But it's ironic that you're using your mother's life, your mother's power, your mother's food, so you have strength and a clear mind, your mother's clothing, and your mother's house to tell your friend how much you hate your mom. And when we're mingling with people, we need to be patient. Then it says he sympathizes with them. Because the fact that he says, I'm desiring your good, they're lacking some good. Mm -hmm. You're only going to know that if you're a friend. So you want to do this kind of evangelism where we don't need to know people. Mm -hmm. I ain't trying to get people's lives. People got issues. Baptize <laughs> 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 them to move on. <laughs> You really got to get it. I hate my father. Okay. I'll pray for you. I'm not trying to get emotionally involved in that. But that's what Jesus did. He sympathized with people. Had compassion. Then it says he ministered to their needs. You know, for some of us, we struggle with this. We need to be tangible. Your mother doesn't say, I love you, but you ain't got no food on the table. Oh, baby, I really love you. But mom's decked out. Mom, we gotta have some food. Oh, no, I love you. Don't worry. <laughs> Go ahead. Get some food for yourself. But you love <laughs> Most moms, <laughs> you're looking at our society, it's the same thing. Your Muslim friend is like, okay, you say that you love me, that God is love, and all these things about love, but can we get practical? I was in South Africa, University of Nitz, and uh, this girl came to me after one of my presentations. Uh, I think this was back in 2004. She said, Brother Sebastian, I have a question. You know, I have a roommate every week, you know. I've talked, we've had a Bible study on the Sabbath. I thought she accepted me, but she's not keeping me up. She comes home, the room's real clean, all this other stuff, and I'm like, you know, why is she keeping this out? And then I confronted her. I was like, hold on. She's like, what am I supposed to do? I said, have you ever thought about cleaning her side of the room? <coughs> she just stared at me. <laughs> uh, no. Why not? If you're so intent about her keeping this out, clean her side of the room. <laughs> then when she comes back, oh, thanks. Yeah, I did it. So you wouldn't have to do it before the Sabbath because I know you have class. I guarantee you, she will see a whole different aspect. <clears throat> when you're telling me, keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, peace out, Lord. I hope that works out for you. <laughs> I'm, my side is clean. How in the world are you going to clean half a room? <laughs> Just super fair vehicle. <laughs> it's like, my stuff is right with God. When are you going to get yours right with God? It's like, <laughs> have, can you imagine you're all siblings? You come home, you're like, look, daddy just won't be going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> like, you your room. We take that mindset into the world so we can call each other brother and sister in the church, but you really know about how you treat your actual sister and brother. 
no sense we treat people like that. Because for sure, I know many of you would not clean your sister's room to prepare for the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> my room is clean, I'm about to enjoy my freedom. Yeah. Rather than thinking, I'm so serious about my sister making it to heaven. Your blood sister. <laughs> you will clean her room. Because <laughs> I don't want her to be lost. Amen. That's ministry. There's no glory in that. Because who knows how many weeks you have to do that baby room. Until finally it clicks in her mind. And she's literally walking home. It's, it's interesting. Birthdays, graduations, that's what brings tears to people's eyes. So this girl cleaned my room every week. And even if she doesn't choose to follow Jesus, then when she meets another advent, hmm. she says, Oh, Sebastian, where are you flying to? Oh, I'm flying to go to Lyon. Where are you? I'm flying there too. Yeah, I'm seven day Adventist. Are you serious? My roommate in college was 70 years old. Amazing woman. I think she's going to respond when I start talking to her about the Bible. Mm -hmm. She's ready to listen. Mm -hmm. And even though you may not have been able to give the same answers I can give because I'm a preacher, you prepared the word. Mm -hmm. You may never talk to her again. You may never know if she gave her life to Christ. Then you get to heaven. You're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no idea. <laughs> So, in using Christ's method, be around non-Adventists. Too many of us are not comfortable around non-Adventists. When I train my missionaries, I require them. I have a specific exercise. I want you to leave. <laughs> leave. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Away from your Adventist friends. And I want you to go to a coffee shop. I want you to go to a library. I want you to be around non-Adventists and be friendly to them. We walk in, we're just in the library room. Oh, someone's at that table. Four seats, one person. I can't share a table with them. I don't even know them. What? Doesn't make any sense. As a missionary, I'm like, yes. Maybe the Lord has prepared this table for me. So I walk into the library room. Okay. Who knows who this person is? The Bible already told you, beware of me. So you go on campus, oh, this, this table, he's already studying there. I go to this table study. Now I'm there to study, but I'm also like, Lord, give me an opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Get into something. Oh, yeah, what do you study? Oh, yeah, do you mind if I study? No, 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 thanks a lot. Yeah, I appreciate it. Then, you know, put my Bible on the table. You never know what's going to come up. <laughs> oh, you're a Christian. Do you understand? This is mingling. And then the guy says, you know, I have a lot of issues with Christians. You know, da, da, da. my father was a pastor and I used to beat my mom. 